It is Wednesday, folks. So back to our backbench battle with Labor MP Julian Hill and the Liberal MP Keith Wallahan out of Canberra. It is timely that we've uh, got a couple of Victorians on the program this morning, gentlemen, given the emergency that's gripping the state today. So, Keith, I'll start with you. 500,000 homes without power. Is it old infrastructure or is this just what happens when it's caught in the line of fire? I think with all of these things, uh, we've got to do a proper analysis of what happened. Can I just say my thoughts are with those who are immediately affected and particularly the, the firefighters who've been involved in this. I, I understand there was five CFA volunteers who had a blowover. I hope they're OK. And it just reminds us all as Victorians uh, how precious our CFA volunteers are and how grateful we are to have them. I think we need to look at the reliability and the resilience of the Victorian energy grid. Uh, this is a wake-up call for Victorians and for us here in this place. Uh, there is a transition occurring, but, but is it being done in a way that respects uh, the needs that are here now? And, and I think we need to do our homework on that. OK. We'll come back to that. But, Julian, I want to get your thoughts on what Keith was just saying. The Victorian grid, is it vulnerable? Does this prove it? Oh, well, I'd echo Keith's concern for those affected. There's large swathes of my community that lost power last night in South East Melbourne, including my office, actually. The phones were down and the staff. Um, cars are still there because they couldn't get the gate open um, to even get their vehicles out, and that was true for many businesses across mm. Dandenong and the region. Uh, I'd also um, send thoughts to the first responders, but also the people out there battling the heat, um, trying to repair the grid. The, the scenes that we saw yesterday was a toxic combination, if you like, of storms, of heat waves and bushfires. Uh, but those photos of those huge high voltage tower li uh, power mm. line uh, towers knocked down um, are, st are stunning. I mean, they're stunning visual images, but they show the scale of the destruction of the storms. Uh, unfortunately, this is exactly what scientists have been predicting uh, with accelerating climate change, that we will see more and more of these combination of weather events. So is the state doing enough and, and back to that question, how vulnerable is the Victorian grid? Well, I, I think, uh, as Keith rightly observed, we need to take time, firstly, to restore the power. And these storms and incidents have happened before where we've had major transmission lines knocked out in the state's history. So we need to focus on restoring the power uh, and then examine exactly okay. what happened and whether there's any lessons to be learned. But to be very clear, the grid stability issues uh, were caused um, by extreme weather events. That's yeah. the information that's come to hand so far. Yeah. So what do you want to see change? Before we move on, um, Keith, well, you, you just sort of you hinted at this in your first response. Um, the way forward here. I think the way forward is to recognise what are the sources of power that are reliable now. And, and in particular, we've seen that gas plays a crucial role in that bridge between coal and renewables. Renewables aren't quite at the scale and the reliability that Victorians and Australians need right now. And gas plays a crucial role. And what we're seeing again and again is this demonising of gas. It's an important fuel source, particularly for energy, particularly in Victoria. Victoria relies on coal source power more than any other, any other state in the country. And gas is very important. And that's a key initial lesson from this. OK, let's get to the other. Um, the big federal issue at the moment is the detainees. Julian, back to you. Just as you started getting some momentum, comes the detention saga again. Is Andrew Giles a drag on your party at the moment? Oh, what we've seen in the parliament in the last couple of days is frankly bizarre. It's always telling what they don't want to talk about. We've had no questions on Labor's tax cuts, uh, no questions on cost of living relief, no questions on wage rises, the best wage rises for the last 15 years. Um, Andrew Giles is someone I've known since I was 19. Uh, he's a person of enormous integrity. And if the opposition are mis you know, choosing to mistake calmness for weakness, then they're making a serious mistake. But by being vague on questions and being vague on details, he either doesn't know or he's being deceptive. I mean, both of which are bad for a minister, are they not? No, I just think that's nonsense. I mean, if we want to talk about questions um, from Home Affairs, Andrew stood there and answered every question the last two days. Um, and he'll do so again if they want to keep asking the questions and don't want to talk about tax relief, tax cuts and all the other things going on. Um, but to be very clear, if we want to talk about questions on Home Affairs, they don't want to talk about uh, the mess, the shambles that the Home Affairs Department was in, as the Richardson Review revealed. Uh, the former minister, a guy called Peter Dutton, overseeing the signing of contracts with criminal syndicates, with people accused of money laundering, 
the people accused of trying to break US sanctions on Iran. They don't want to talk about that. They don't want to talk about the Nixon review, showing that the former immigration minister, oh, a guy called Peter Dutton, presided over an utter shambles, criminal syndicates, human trafficking, misusing our migration system. They don't want to talk about the Parkinson review, showing that migration policy was non-existent and the broken mess that is the Department of Home Affairs. I mean, this is an attempt at a distraction. What the documents, which the opposition are salivating over from Senate estimates revealed, is the government's utterly relentless focus on community safety in responding to a decision of the High Court. And I'll just finish on that point. I'll say it slowly. Keith was a barrister. He was a gun for hire before he was in the Parliament. High Court of Australia. I mean, is the opposition actually seriously suggesting that any Australian government should not follow the decision of the High Court? It's the Even foundation there was a warning. of the rule of law in our country. A five-month warning. Keith, I've got to jump in. Get your thoughts on that. No, thank you for that, Pete. Uh, we need to go back to last year, the September High Court decision of NZYQ. When we put these questions to the government and to the minister, we were told that it was a big surprise, a jack-in-the-box moment where al Kateb was overturned and it was unexpected. What we've heard from Senate estimates recently is that there is no way this was unexpected. No way this was unexpected. Mm. The Attorney General's office was notified after the directions hearing in June that there was a real prospect that this would be overturned. And, and, and let's return to the actual case. This had 100 pages of submissions. In, and the first line, I've read the submissions, the first line in all of the submissions was that this was the question, whether al Kateb would be overturned. Of course, the High Court will make its own decisions on the law, but it's about how you respond. And what we found from this government is that they weren't prepared for that response and they have shown themselves to be wanting since. This minister is not across the detail and he's not across his portfolio. Keith, Julian, we're out of time. Uh, good to chat to you both, as always. We'll talk to you again soon.